I think I've left enough of a gap between the last ionizer video, so let's do another one because this was inspired. It's been sitting here for a while, but it was inspired by the HVAC overtime uh, episode. It was a live stream where they were discussing the, the positive and negative ion generators being fitted into large industrial air conditioning systems. So this is a really old one. It's the Mountain Breeze Computer Ionizer. Destroys screen static and freshens the atmosphere. And this is from the era that home computers were just coming into play. And we had this situation, I'll just zoom up in this a little bit, that uh, people sitting in front of the early cathode ray tube video monitors found it quite fatiguing on their eyes. So it says, fights VODs, the feeling of irritation and tiredness often experienced by prolonged exposure to VDU screens has been termed video operator's distress syndrome, VODs. With a screen equipped with a computer ionizer, the positive charges are neutralized, the positive electrostatic field is destroyed, and an enlivened, negative, iron-rich atmosphere is produced. And then it goes on with all the sort of scientific research stuff. So let's get straight into this. This was being sold because, uh, the, apart from the fact that people were using more and more computers at work, people were also buying home computers and then sitting really close to their screens. And... In the same way we've got the 5G, anti-5G campaigners these days, uh, there was a whole campaign against, you know, how damaging cathode ray tubes were and how kids shouldn't sit in front of them. So this is small. It also has that horrible thing where the polystyrene case, that's styrofoam if you live in America, uh, normally the cable would be wrapped in plastic and it would be protected from the styrofoam. But in this case, it's been put directly in and the polystyrene has melted all over the cable. Now, I should plug this in, shouldn't I? Or should I open it first? Maybe I should open it first. You're not going to see an awful lot. About the most distinctive thing about this is that it's quite small. Let's get the polystyrene out the way. It's quite small and it has a LED, I think, instead of the... Unless it's a neon behind the sort of LED. If it is an LED, they would have used the LEDs for the visual effect that, you know, it's modern and electronic. Has this ever been used? I don't think this has ever been used. I don't see any damage in the wires. I think it's pretty much been given to someone as a gift to protect them from the evils of cathode ray tubes. And then it's been stuck in a cupboard. Right, tell you what, let's plug this in. Let's use the hoppy, the hoppy is not going to detect an awful lot, so I'll just stuff the wires in here. And I shall plug it in, and I don't expect an awful lot. Well, except if it's faulty and then it goes bang. Okay, what are we getting? The LED's glowing. It's a gallium arsenide LED. It's shimmering, so it's straight off the mains. Uh, you'd expect that, because uh, it, gallium nitride LEDs didn't exist back then. I'll just move this lamp holder out of my way. Power consumption is not detectable. This is not uncommon for ionizers. I can hear it hissing. Can you hear it hissing? And if I lick the back of my hand and put it in front of the needles, I can feel the draft. It creates a electrostatic charge. I should go into that afterwards for those of you who are not familiar with it. The main thing is it's working, but there is... I know it's all charged up to high voltage inside. Lovely. Uh, but... It's drawing virtually no power, it's just the way it is. Uh, I've, I've tested it, it works, let's open it. And get all more polystyrene off here, which I can vacuum up later. Lovely. It comes with a warranty card. Mountain Breeze Free Post Skelmersdale WN89BR. I don't know who will actually be there these days. Well, it's a free post, so it's just a, it's not going to go to any particular address. Maybe I'll send it in anyway, see if my I can start my warranty. Uh, the owner of Mountain Breeze got in touch recently and just said he'd really enjoyed watching the videos of his vintage stuff being done uh, before he sold out. He said in the manufacturing days, he said, thank goodness I'm not doing that again because manufacturing in the UK is, is complicated and tricky. But it comes, it, well, a lot of the ionizers came with Air Care News and it would, uh, it's got all this sort of, it's almost, it's got a little end of quackery to it. And it says, fact, what the new scientist said. The esteemed journal, the new scientist said, negative ions benefit the human body in many ways and are necessary for full mental and physical health. In recognition of the effect of tobacco, tobacco smoke, some company executives have installed negative ion generators in their offices and conference rooms. 
and it's got all the things that it can possibly do including the uh, visual picture of the the test that you put it in a chamber and you blow cigarette smoke into it if you turn an ionizer on and you've actually got two next to each other identical ones the one with the ionizer will precipitate it out to the surfaces very quickly that's how the ionizers work they put a charge in the air let's open this i think this is glued together the early ones were i don't see any any sign of screws it says two watt nominal but in reality usually the most power is taken by the power indicator let's see if we can pop this open it may be super well glued shut in which case i may have to pause while i try and crack it open because uh, otherwise uh, you'll get loud distorting noises i smack it with a hammer feels like a, a terrible thing to be opening something like this but hey and potentially damage it but they did glue them shut and we need to see what's in the side i'm not getting anywhere with this oh 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 i'm getting crunchy noises reassuring crunchy noises that looks pretty good to me oh what are we getting here what are we getting here oh the guy who owned mountain breeze uh told me that the reason they had the yellow plastic inside round them i thought it was some sort of electrostatic shield it was to satisfy the requirements of double insulation oh that kind of came out so here's the circuit board this is the double insulation layer excellent Right, tell you what, let's whip that double insulation off and take a look at the circuitry underneath. I wonder how old this one is. The needles in the front, they've got copper tape. Hold on. Can I do this? Can I get this out? Uh, the LED's kind of jammed in. It's got copper tape with the needles poked through and then soldered in the back, mainly covered in the solder because I think they'll probably be stainless steel needles or steel needles. Tiny ones, little short ones. I wonder if they were custom needles. Right, tell you what, let's see if we can get the rest of the circuitry out. Keep in mind, it is probably charged quite a high voltage. I should really make an effort to discharge it to a degree of what I can, because uh, it will give me little zaps otherwise. I'd guess that this little sleeve here, this little red sleeve, is probably... I'll tell you what, let's just uh, use the scissors in this. I could pause, but, you know, it's better to actually see it live, isn't it? What can I do here? There should be a gap in the middle if this is the usual design. I'm guessing that they... I wonder when they switch to using the uh, the this heat shrink versus the old yellow Captain tape type stuff. Which came first? I don't know how old this is other than the fact that as computers were coming in in the late 70s, early 80s, that's when this is likely to have made an appearance. Hmm... A bit uncomfortable about this because I get the feeling that there might be something under there, but I think it's maybe just the rigidity of the stuff. I'll we nibble at it. If it's going to take too long, I shall pause. Or you can just skip forward. You can do that. I think it's just the fact this has been well shrunk down and being heat shrink, it's got thick as it's done it. Okay, here we go. First oddity. Oh, wow. There's a little electro electrolytic capacitor. Uh, let's work out the LED driver. It's going to be a resistor based. Have they honestly put a high power resistor? No, they've got a one mega ohm resistor there, which uh, is probably to uh, just discharge that capacitor. They may actually have used a capacitor dropper for the LED. That'd be interesting. That would be a first for uh, the mountain breezy type stuff. But tell you what. Oh, tell you what. I'm going to try. Uh, some isopropyl alcohol down the back of this. One moment, please. Well, I gave up trying to get that out. Uh, that's much easier now that I can actually... that it's flexible. So, uh, I took this out completely. It's a bit drizzly with the flux in the back, but that's all right. Um, provisional looks suggest that this is using a very early capacitive drop of the LED. That's unusual. That's a bit ahead of its time. Right, tell you what... I'm going to reverse engineer this. It looks like a standard ionizer. The most different bit is the LED indicator because they've gone for that futuristic look. So uh, I shall reverse engineer this. I, mean, I can tell really what it's going to be, but hey, I shall reverse engineer it anyway. And we'll take a look at the circuitry and see how it was made. Back once again for the Renegade Master D4 Damager Power to the people. Let's take a look at the circuitry. That is just a song that pops into my head every time I say that. Back once again. 
The circuitry is divided into two sections. It's got the LED power supply and it's got the actual traditional capacitive multiplier for the, uh, the ionizer. And this is quite a step forward because up to that point, I'm pretty sure that Mountain Breeze had just used a resistor and an E indicator. So it's included, it's, well, it's involved a lot of extra circuitry and it's really unusual that they have used a X2 capacitor, a suppression capacitor. Um, is that an X2? Yes, it is. It's an X2. As the dropper for that, it was a bit ahead of its time, really, in a way. Uh, that's how modern LED lamps might work. So it's got the 100 nanofarad capacitor with a 1 mega ohm discharge resistor across it. That's the 1 mega ohm discharge resistor down there. Super high rated. It's very high power for the extra voltage rating. There is a diode then straight across. This is where it loses a bit of efficiency. If they'd added two more diodes to the circuit, but you know that would have involved more space. A rectifier would have just pushed the price up. Um, but uh, they used a diode. It would have made it much more efficient if they'd used a bridge rectifier. But they use one diode, so effectively the LED is being driven half wave, but it's got a capacitor across it to smooth that a little bit. The capacitor is rated 16 volts, uh, 22 microfarad. I shall write that in, 22 microfarad, 22 microfarad. Uh, and it's got a really generously rated 560 ohm resistor in series with it. And then the other diode is the other part of the push-pull arrangement uh, that's needed. You can't, if they'd removed that diode there, the, diode, the capacitor would literally have just kind of charged up and then all you'd have got it is like a little trickle current going through that resistor there. It needs that push-pull effect of the two diodes. The, then it goes to the classic Mountain Breeze multiplier. Now, it's worth mentioning that this circuitry only really kind of works in Europe uh, or other countries that have a 220 to 240 volt supply. Because it does require that initial high voltage before boosting it up. And I have seen other uh, units that use uh, a tapped transformer so they can be used in America and the UK. But they actually use a transformer to actually boost the voltage up to a higher level and then a lower number of stages. But what we have here, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 on either side capacitors. And then they're linked with uh, the diodes. I've not drawn all the capacitors in this because it's the same circuit, but it just extends up higher. It's a standard multiplier. The main thing is that where the live comes in, just as live went straight to the capacitor there, which is also a, a kind of safety feature, but it goes to this capacitor. And the main thing when you're doing this voltage uh, multiplier thing is that there's no diode between here and there, because if it, although it looks like there should be with the zigzaggy diode ladder, that would affect the put a diode across live and neutral. And I did that when I was young. It was very, very loud and blew lots of tracks off the circuit board. Uh, but the idea is you've got these uh, capacitors that are rated 10 nanofarad, 630 volt. They don't need to be a high value. And you've got your 1N4007 diodes. And with the AC, it just gently shuffles the voltage up higher. It's not super efficient type of circuit, but for ionization, that is all that's needed. And at the output, for protection, for safety against people touching needles. There are two unusually high value resistors, two 10 mega ohm resistors, but that's just, you know, the value of those resistors is nothing compared to the current and the voltage involved. It's very high voltage, extremely low current. So it lifts the voltage to a high negative level because all the diodes are pointing down the way towards the, the AC end, the mains end, where it finds a reference through the mains to ground. But the other end, uh, the high voltage is presented to these needles and that's these, this little cluster of three needles on the back of this copper tape uh, just poked through the panel and then uh, soldered on. And uh, when you apply a high voltage to a sharp needle tip, the area of charge is greatest at the, the sharpest point. So it tends to impart an extra negative charge onto air molecules or dust or anything that comes nearby takes on a negative charge and then because you've got two negative charges next to each other they are propelled off the front that's what makes the the hissing noise and the sort of the slight draft of ions the ions being negatively charged air molecules which have an extra electron on them um the negative aspect of it's quite important because uh you could make a positive ionizer and the modern dual polarity ones have a a positive and a negative arrangement, but uh, 
generally speaking, for a standard electrostatic charge ionizer, it's they go with negative because that adds electrons onto things. If if it was a positive, if they reverse these diodes, it would make it a positive ionizer and effectively strip electrons off the air. And I did build when I was young. I accidentally, my first ever DIY ionizer, I did put all the diodes the wrong way. I thought just I got it wrong and all the diodes point towards the end. And I was sharing a workshop with a, a group of co-workers and I built it and said, we're going to plug this in now. In a moment, you'll feel all the invigorating effect of the ions and stuff like that. And it, it like we turned it on and left it on for a while. Then they independently started saying it's not making me feel great. It's making me feel all muzzy and headachy. It's just like it's not, it doesn't make me feel exhilarated. And that's when I realised I had done that. So maybe there is something to that. Maybe that was just coincidental that it was a strange ambient atmosphere that day. Or maybe the stripping of electrons does have a sort of negative effect on people as opposed to adding extra charge into the air. Don't know. It's it's one of these unpredictable things. You could ask people, but, you know, just by the very fact you ask them, you'll, you, they'll analyse something that they hadn't even considered before. But the whole concept then of the negative ionizer is that it does put that charge out, but the main benefit is that it uh, puts an electrostatic charge into the air, charges stuff up, and it does precipitate dust out there. I know that it's a controversial area again, but if you have a table and you sit an ionizer on the ed edge of it, then you lift it up after a, a while, you'll see that round the ionizer is a dark sort of shaded area where it's been attracting the dust and you'll get an absolutely perfectly clean square where the ionizer was sitting. So they do have an effect. Let's take a look at the technology here, the construction actually. This looks like it's been assembled. Let's, uh, let's zoom out a bit and break this image up. I'll get the notepad out of the way and I shall brighten this up a tad. It looks as though th there's plenty of flux that's been liberated. This has been hand soldered. The whole thing was probably hand assembled in that era. And it looks as though they've had it in a rack like this. Because as they've soldered it, you can actually see where the flux has actually drizzled slightly down the way on all of those. And the component leads, the uh, capacitor leads, look as though they're full length. They've not been cropped at all. They would be quite short out the packet. Um, and the diodes they have, well, they possibly have been... Are they all the same length? They are all the same length. So they've possibly been pre-cropped before being put in, which would actually make it quite hard to put in. Unless they'd been put through the lead forming machine, in which case they would uh, be more or less, you know, the correct space just to actually drop through. They do have quite big holes for that. This looks like the person that designed this has been making ionizers, so they know exactly what's going to make it easier for manufacture. Um, other things, the, the grommet here with a nice... Uh, the cable tie for strain relief. I'm not sure why they've got a cable tie there as well. But um, they have cable tied the end of the wires together there. And that's about it. It is the classic 22 capacitor arrangement. And I wonder if they, they did an experiment, you know, what's the minimum number of capacitors required to uh, get the ionization effect? Was it an economy thing? Or was it that thing but that by uh, keeping the voltage low enough, just to the borderline that it could create the charge without pushing it, pushing the ions out too hard, so to speak, that they were able to keep the notorious ozone levels down. Because you do, at the tips of the needles, you get a very slight, in a dark room, you'll see a very slight corona discharge. It's that slight purple glow. But it is, you have to go into an absolutely jet black room and you have to let your eyes acclimatise before you see that, just the, the three little dots of the purple glow in the end. And uh, that does create a trace quantity of ozone, which might be part of the secret of, uh, of ionisers, because they'll create ozone pretty much down at a low level that you wouldn't find in a house, but you would actually find outdoors in nature. But um, the thing, other thing about ionizers is that once they've charged the air, if the air's got a strong negative charge, it puts out less ions into the air until that's been dissipated. So it's useful to have a fan to stir the air up. But with the higher voltage, it may have just kept pushing uh, ions out and that would potentially have caused more corona discharge. But this is speculation. But there we go. I've never seen one of these particular model before. Uh, it was good to take to bits. It was glued together, as they always did. Um, and very handmade looking. But, uh, very neat. And, well, as ionizers go, they were one of the first 
ionizers, the really successful commercial ionizers, and uh, made in England, and uh, they were very typical of that style. So very interesting, well worth taking apart and exploring and seeing the construction and the use of that gallium phosphide, traditional old-fashioned green LED, just to give it that more modern computer age look.